Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about data structures and memory representations in NVivo. First, we're going to discuss the different data structures and how they relate to each other and to OpenGL concepts. And afterwards, we will look at how the data is actually stored and how it is moved between different storage devices and contexts. Lastly, we're also going to glimpse at how to actually access the data on the CPU. So let's start by looking at the data structures. The three main structures in NVivo are the volume, images, and meshes. The volume data structure handles data that is aligned in a 3D structured grid. The type of the individual voxels can be any basic numerical type or vectors of such. Images are similar to OpenGL frame buffers. That means an NVivo image is a set of possibly multiple actual images stored in layers, similar to having different attachments on an OpenGL frame buffer. Those layers can of course also be of different type. Lastly, the mesh holds a set of buffer objects. Each buffer can contain an arbitrary number of elements, which may be of arbitrary type. For a standard mesh, this includes a VEC-free position buffer, normal buffer, possibly color buffer, and one or more index buffers. Now that we know the most relevant data types, let me tell you that none of those actually store any data. They are all just handles for different memory representations. The memory representation abstraction handles the actual storage of data in a device-independent way. That means that for each data structure, there are memory representations for each storage type. In the case of the volume, that means there is a volume disk representation, a volume RAM representation, and a volume GL representation that represents a volume either on disk, in CPU memory, or in GPU memory inside of an OpenGL context. Note that there might also be multiple representations per device, depending on the framework. For example, there is also an OpenCL representation that is stored on the GPU, and if you wanted to use, say, CUDA code inside of NVivo, you would also just define a type of CUDA representation and an appropriate converter. Depending on what representation your processors need, representation converters will take care of transferring the data to the appropriate device and wrapping it in the appropriate representation. That way, you can use the data structure handles like volume without having to think about exact storage details or synchronizing updates to your data across devices and contexts. Let's look at a common example to understand how representations work. We want to render a mesh with its bounding box. The mesh handle has several different buffers, but we will look at the vertex buffer only here. First, the buffer gets initialized with a buffer RAM representation in the mesh source where it is loaded from the hard drive into RAM. For the mesh and buffer, there is actually no disk representation like there is for volume. Next, the bounding box is computed on the CPU. For this, the vertex buffer is requested as buffer RAM representation. Since this representation does already exist, NVivo can access it without any data transfers. If a requested representation is not available or not up to date, NVivo looks for the representation that is up-to-date and has the shortest chain of conversions to the desired representation. The buffer RAM representation is first used to compute the bounding box on the CPU. Next, the buffers are needed in an OpenGL context for rendering, so the buffer RAM representations are uploaded to the GPU and thus converted to buffer GL representations. In this example, I said the bounding box is computed on the CPU. Let's see how this works exactly. To actually get access to specific representations, you can either make a call to get representation for a read-only representation or to get editable representation for an editable one. If you choose to edit a representation, that will automatically invalidate all other representations in the data structure handle to make sure that your new changes will be in other representations as well. As a result of this, any other requested representation must be rebuilt using the converters since all the existing representations, except the modified one, have old data. When we have a representation at hand, this gives us direct access to the void pointer that points to the address of the desired data in memory. From here, you should use the dispatch method to access the data safely in the correct type. The dispatch method has a type parameter to specify the result type of the computation on the data. In our case, that is a pair of fig fours for the lower left and upper right corners of the bounding box for coordinates with four components. Further, this patch takes a lambda with the typed data as parameter. 
This allows you to specify the computation on the correctly typed data in the Lambda's function body. But what is the benefit of using this dispatch method? Well, using C++ type deduction, you can write the computation in a type invariant manner to support all kinds of data types easily. For the bounding box computation, it should not matter whether the vertex coordinates are stored as float, double, or integer. And with the dispatch concept, we only need to write the computation once. To do so, we must set the lambda's parameter to the auto type, which lets C++ instantiate the correct type. Extracting this value type, we can define the computation generically, and C++ will instantiate this code for all viable types automatically. Ultimately, with those concepts, we can work with our data easily, without having to manage storage devices or data types. And that is it for this video. To find out more about the dispatch functionality, check out our written guides on memory representations. Also, come and check out our Slack for questions and discussions. Thanks for watching.